Good evening. Comet Hale-Bopp is now getting brighter. Here's a recent drawing made by Paul Doherty. As you can see, the comet already has something in the way of a tail, and it may be quite spectacular, I think, by the end of the year. But this evening, I want to look back in time, 150 years, to 1846, September the 23rd. And that was a great day in the history of astronomy, a day when a new planet, the one we call Neptune, was discovered and added to the solar system. You can see Neptune now in the evening sky. It's in the constellation of Capricornus, but I'm afraid you do need a telescope or binoculars to see it. It's too faint to be seen with the naked eye. The matter here is round about eight. Uh, here's a picture taken way back in 1989 by Douglas Arnold. That bright thing is, in fact, the planet Saturn, and close to it, about 10 o'clock on the clock face, you can see Neptune, and that shows how small Neptune appears compared with Saturn. And from here, telescopes don't, see a, don't show a great deal on it. It shows a pale, bluish disk, and there's a Paul Dirty drawing. But, of course, it was bypassed in 1989 by the Voyager space probe, and there's a Voyager picture showing the great dark spot. But what exactly is Neptune like? Well, it's um, a gas giant, it's a long way from the sun, more than 2,700 million miles. It takes 165 years to go around. It has a very short day of only just over 16 hours. In size, diameter, 30,000 miles. Very much larger than the Earth, as you can see. And also, it's heavy. If you put Neptune in one pan of a gigantic pair of scales, you would need 17 Earths to balance it. So it really does qualify as a giant, even though it's only about half the size of Saturn. Well, uh, let's have a look now at the solar system. There's a plan. First of all, the Sun, and four small worlds, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars. Then there's a wide gap in which move thousands of small bodies, known as asteroids or minor planets. And then we come to the four gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, plus one small, weird little place, Pluto, which may not be a proper planet at all, has a strange orbit that brings it inside Neptune's. Now, the five inner planets are bright, naked eye objects, and they've been known since very early times. The outer three, Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto, have not. You can just see Uranus with the naked eye, if you know where it is, but Neptune and Pluto are too faint. And they've been discovered in what we may call telescopic times. And the story really begins with William Herschel. He was a Hanoverian musician who came to England, spent the rest of his life here, and in the 1770s began to make telescopes. And there is a Herschel telescope, a typical reflector, and it may have been with this telescope, or one very like it, uh, the, from the garden of his home, 19 New King Street in Bath, in March 1781, he made his great discovery. He was, in fact, checking on the stars, what he called a review of the heavens, and suddenly he came across something that obviously was not a star. For one thing, it showed a disk, and no star does that. Secondly, from night to night, it moved. And Herschel realized straight away it must be a member of the solar system. He thought it might be a comet, but as soon as the path was calculated, it was found to be a new planet, the one we now call Uranus. And telescopically, you can in fact see a disk upon Uranus. Here is a picture of it, the one that I drew with my own telescope. Here is a Voyager picture taken in 1986. It doesn't show much more because Uranus is a bland kind of world. Here's a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, and that shows rather more, a few clouds. But Uranus certainly doesn't have the definite surface features of Jupiter or Saturn, or even, in fact, Neptune. The solar system appeared to be complete, but there was a but there. When a planet's found, the first thing that's done is to work out how it moves. The orbit's calculated. This was done for Uranus, and before long, it became very clear that something was wrong. Uranus was not behaving. It wandered away from its predicted path, so there was something disturbing it. Various people had ideas about what it might be. One was the Reverend T.J. Hussey, the rector of Hayes in Kent, an amateur astronomer. And he reasoned this way. Just suppose Uranus is being pulled out of position by an unknown planet further away from the sun. By studying the wanderings of Uranus, could one track down where this unknown planet might be? Hussey believed so. He also might show a disk. And he wrote to England's leading astronomer, George Airy, who was then at Cambridge, but on the following year, went to the Royal Greenwich Observatory to become Astronomer Royal there, had a long and very profitable re regime there. And Hussey wrote to Airy, making the suggestion. Airy was not encouraging. Now, Airy was undoubtedly a great man in many respects, a brilliant organiser, great telescope maker, and did a great deal of good for the observatory. But he was also obsessed with order and method. It's said that on one occasion, he spent most of a day in the cellars of the Royal Observatory, labelling empty boxes empty, and he hated interfering with routine. Also, he was not very impressed with Hussey's arguments. 
He wrote back and said, um, even though this is so, that I think mathematical science is not yet in such a state as to give the smallest hope of identifying an unknown planet by the one of Uranus. I think Hussey was probably rather discouraged, and he did no more, and there for some time the matter rested. Later on, along came Friedrich Bessel in Germany. Now, Bessel was a great mathematician. He achieved lasting fame in 1838, when he became the first man to measure the distance of a star. And he also was attracted by the Uranus problem. He believed that a new planet might be tracked down, and he intended to look for it. He didn't. He was in ill health and died rather prematurely. So again, things drifted on. 1841, along came John Couch Adams. Born at Lidcott in Cornwall, his cottage there still stands, he went to Cambridge and took a mathematics degree quite brilliantly. And he became interested in the problem of Uranus. And there's a note in his diary in 1841, resolved as soon as completing my degree to take up this problem. And he believed he could track down where the new planet might be. A kind of cosmic detective problem. He could see the victim, Uranus, he had to track down the culprit. Uh, he wanted some information, so he wrote to James Chalice, Professor of Astronomy at Cambridge, and requesting some data. Chalice wrote to Airy, and Airy did in fact send the data. Adams began work. And by mid-1845, Adams were fairly sure he had at least an approximate position for the new planet. And that's where the chat for vaccines began. Obviously, he wanted to see Airy, so he called at Greenwich. Airy was bored. And then in October, 1845, Adams went to see Airy twice. On the first occasion, Airy was out. On the second occasion, Airy was having dinner and couldn't be disturbed. He probably never knew Adams had called. By this way, that was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Airy always had dinner sharply at 3 o'clock. Don't ask me why. Anyway, Adams didn't see him. Adams then wrote to Airy. Airy did reply, but asked a question about the radius vector, which Adams regarded as trivial. And unfortunately, Adams did not reply. And that turned out to be a very serious mistake. Nothing happened, things drifted on. But meanwhile, unknown to Adams, or to Airy at the time, things were happening across the channel. Irma Jean-Joseph Riverier, a young French astronomer, had taken up the problem. He is said to have been one of the rudest men who has ever lived, and a colleague did say of him, he may not have been the most detestable man in France, he was certainly the most detested. Whether that was justified or not, I don't know. I have a sort of feeling it wasn't, but one will probably never know. Anyway, Le Verrier took up the same kind of problem, working along the same lines as Adams. Remember, Le Verrier knew nothing about Adams, had no idea anyone else was seriously interested in Uranus. He worked away, and he began to get results. And unlike Adams, he published his preliminary findings. And uh, at the end of 1845, uh, one of these memoirs arrived on Airy's desk at Greenwich. Now, Airy looked at it and then realized, he, re he remembered Adams, and realized that Leverio's result was about the same as that of Adams. And therefore, clearly, there was a question for Hunt. And one would imagine that the first thing Airy would do as astronomer royal would be to use the telescopes at Greenwich to organize the hunt there. And that's exactly what he did not do. For one thing, it would have meant disturbing the observatory routine. And secondly, there was no really suitable telescope at Greenwich at the time. The nearest one was at Cambridge, the Northumberland Equatorial. There, in fact, is the dome. And here is the present Northumberland telescope, although the optics are not the same as they are now as they were in 1846. Now, remember, the professor of astronomy there was James Chalice. And Airy instructed Chalice to use that telescope to begin a search for the new planet in the position indicated by Adams. Well. The same, what was was this? What was told to do, Chalice used the telescope, allowed the stars to drift through the field, and then checked them against a star map to see whether over a few nights he could find a, a star-like object which moved and must therefore be a member of the solar system. It was a laborious process. He hadn't any really good maps. Also, he was preoccupied with a comet, Beeler's comet, that had come back and had astonished astronomers by splitting in half. Uh, don't look for Beeler's comet now, by the way. It's not been seen since 1852, and it certainly no longer exists. But Chalice was interested in that, rather more so than he was on the planet hunt, and had no real confidence in Adam's results. So he plodded along, wrote to Airy, that this will require many more observations that I can take this year. The trick being, you see, to make two observations over a few nights and then check them, see whether you could find something which moved. And he plodded on. Now, meanwhile, Le Verrier had finished the results, and he sent them to the observatory at Paris. And again, no one there did anything. But patience was not Le Verrier's strong point, not by a long way. He didn't wait. He wrote to an astronomer he knew, Johann Galler, at the observatory of Berlin. And uh, Galler acted very differently. He went straight to see the observatory director, Johann Enker, and requested permission to take telescope time to begin a hunt. And Enker agrees. Let us oblige the gentleman from Paris, was Enker's comment. 
Uh, while they were then joined by Heinrich de Rest, a young astronomer on the staff, who pleaded to be allowed to join in the search. And again, Enker agreed. And they wasted no time. September the 23rd, 1856. That night, they went into the dome where there was a very fine refracting telescope. And there it is today, it's now in a museum, of course. And again, they used the same kind of procedure. Only they had more confidence in the very results than Chalice had in Adams. Galla sat at the telescope, allowed the star to drift through the field, and Dadest checked them against a map. And luckily, they did have a very good, a very new map. And in a few minutes, uh, they came across something that wasn't there. And the dress called out, that star is not on the map. And I think they probably both realized straight away that the hunt was over. They called Anchor, Anchor joined them in the dome, they put on the higher power, and they saw that this object, whatever it might be, showed a small disk, it was unstellar. They followed it till it set, the next night they looked again, and it had moved. So undoubtedly, it was the expected planet, and, uh, and, they, and the gallery went straight to Le Verrier. The planet, whose position you predicted, actually exists. And I may say, the prediction was amazingly accurate. At that stage, the planet was in the constellation Aquarius. And, uh, well, look at this field. There is the position where, in fact, the planet was predicted, and here is where it actually turned up. That was the very first position. Adams was almost as accurate. And we actually have the chart that Galla used with Galla's own notes on it. It was a real mathematical triumph. In 1781, when Uranus was discovered, Uranus was, so to speak, behind Neptune, Bear in mind that Uranus goes around 84 years, Neptune nearly 165, and Neptune was then pulling Uranus along. After 1822, uh, Uranus was ahead, and Neptune was pulling it back. It was by those tiny perturbations that Adams and Leverrier tracked down Neptune, both without knowing about the other. And uh, then along came John Herschel, William Herschel's son, and in an article he mentioned that in fact Adams had got the same result before Leverrier and the French were not pleased, to put it mildly. Remember, they knew nothing about Adams, and as they published nothing, and the French jumped to the conclusion that Adams was trying to steal Le Verrier's glory. And uh, there was very nearly a nasty international incident about it. But luckily, neither Adams nor Le Verrier took much part, in fact, any part at all in that particular controversy. And uh, when they finally met up, they struck up an immediate friendship, although Adams couldn't speak French, and Le Verrier couldn't speak English. Interesting point altogether. So who was to blame? There's no doubt at all that if Airy had been more confident in Adam's results, or if Chalice had been more energetic, then Neptune would have been found. And later, as soon as Chalice heard about the discovery, he checked his observations and found he had in fact recorded the planet twice in the first week of his observations, and had he compared the two, he couldn't have failed to detect Neptune. Also, the question of a disk. One man who looked at Neptune as soon as it was found was William Lassell. He was a brewer, who was an amateur astronomer very, and a very skillful one, and he had a big telescope in Liverpool. That telescope no longer exists in its old form. It's now being reconstructed, and it was a very good instrument indeed. And Lassell looked at Neptune, he saw a disk straight away, and also discovered Triton, the main satellite of Neptune, which is a fairly easy telescopic object. And there's the drawing, Neptune in the middle, and Triton down to the lower left. When I started looking into this story, there was one thing that puzzled me. By late 1845, both Adams and Leverrier thought they knew, at least roughly, where the new planet was. So why didn't they go and look? They didn't need a big telescope. The magnitude of Neptune is above eight, and they thought it was about that. And therefore, even binoculars will show it. And they could have done so. So in the 1980s, I decided to have a go myself. I asked a colleague of mine to look up the position of Neptune, and not tell me exactly where it was, but more or less. I then took about 10 by 8 binoculars and a star chart. I went out and started plotting the stars in that area of a magnitude 8.5 to see where I could find one that moved. And in less than a fortnight, I had tracked down Neptune. So why, in fact, didn't they do it in the 1840s? The answer, of course, was that they were not, in fact, observational astronomers. And Adams didn't even have a telescope until 1844, even then it was a new one. But certainly, they could have done so. It's rather great because Adams, at least, did not do so. Then there was the question of showing a disk. And uh, again, I thought I'd check. Now, Chalice was using a magnification of 166 on the Northumberland telescope. Now, the lens of the Northumberland telescope has now been moved into a second telescope used at a finder down at the Royal Greenwich Observatory that was down at Hurstman, sir. It's the upper of those two telescopes there. So I went down to Hurstman, sir, and I decided to use that lens and Chalice's eyepiece to see whether I could see a disk upon Neptune. And when I looked at Neptune, there was a disk. So how did Chalice miss it? In fact, at one stage, he'd suspected that one of his stars did show a disk and hadn't put on a higher magnification. So again, it was really a question of missed opportunities. Well, nowadays, of course, we know a great deal about Neptune. There's a picture of my Voyager showing the great dark spot.
It's also been imaged recently by the Hubble Space Telescope, and that doesn't show so much. I think the reason there is that Neptune has changed. The great dark spot seems to have disappeared. Whether it's going to reappear? Well, something we don't know. But certainly Neptune is a more dynamic planet than Uranus, even though it's about the same size. It does have a ring. That's an artist's impression. You can't really see the ring from Earth. Triton, of course, is the main satellite, discovered by Lassell. And that's a bit smaller than our moon, with pink nitrogen snow at the poles. And there's Paul Derrida's impression of nitrogen geysers coming up. It must be a weird place. With a... Also, Voyager has covered several extra moons, and there's an impression of one of these moons, Proteus, passing near to Neptune. And if you could go there and have a look at Neptune, it would be a most incredible sight. Whether in fact anyone is going to go there, well, I don't know. It'll take a long time. Even Voyager, launched in 1977, didn't pass Neptune until 1989. There are no more Neptune probes funded as yet. I think they will be in the next century, but whether there are ever going to be a man probe out to that remote part of the solar system, then frankly, I do not know. Certainly not yet. But when and all, looking back on the discovery of Neptune 150 years ago, who really does take the main credit? All the books say that Neptune was discovered uh, by Adams and by Le Verrier. I'm not sure that's quite correct, you know. There's no doubt whatever that Adams made the calculations first, equally no doubt that the planet was identified on the basis purely of Le Verrier's work. But when all is said and done, there's no doubt about one thing. The first men who actually identified Neptune and are therefore the actual discoverers were Johann Galler and Heinrich de Rest. But I think you'd agree it is a fascinating story 150 years ago. Before our next program, there are going to be two eclipses. On September the 27th, there's going to be a total eclipse of the moon, well seen from here. There's a picture of the last total eclipse earlier on this year. The moon passes into the Earth's shadow and turns a dim, often coppery colour before coming out of the shadow again. Worth watching, worth photographing. And then on the 12th of October, there's going to be a partial eclipse of the sun, also well seen from here, when the moon passes in front of the sun and partially blots it out. But one thing I must stress, the sun is dangerous. Even if you're just looking, well, don't stare at the sun for long. It's dangerous. And also, if you're using a telescope or binoculars, never, under any circumstances, look direct. And even putting a dark filter over the cap of the telescope is not safe. You will focus all the sun's heat and light onto your eye and burn your eye out. And this is not mere alarmism. It has happened. If you want to see the sun, uh, either eclipsed or not, then use the telescope and project the sun's image onto a white screen or a card held behind the eyepiece, as I'm doing there. And that is the only sensible way. But let's hope for clear skies. Those two eclipses should be worth seeing. If you want the latest astronomical information, then dial up our Skynet information line, 0891 800 And uh, don't forget also National Astronomy Week. That begins on uh, September the 21st, goes on for a week. Uh, exhibitions and discussions all over the country. I suggest you contact your local society. And uh, when I come back with our next Sky at Night next month, I'm going to be joined by Dr. Chris Kitchen, and we'll be talking about old supernovae. So until then, good night.